when you become a professional in your area of expertise or in your craft, it usually means that you're an expert in what you're in. Because, you know, a professional, I always say, like, I remember people used to ask me sometimes in the creative field, how do you, like, you know, it, sorry, not people used to ask me. This is my own sort of like, um, ad, this is my own sort of like uh, philosophy. I think the only time you're allowed to put like artist, DJ, writer, painter, podcaster, all this stuff in your bio is when it pays you. When somebody pays you for the thing that you do, that's when you can put that shit in your bio. I think before you're paid, it's just a hobby that you're doing. Just a thing that you do for your free time to keep your brain occupied, blah, 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 let off some steam. But as soon as somebody pays you, it doesn't matter if it's $5, if it's a drink token, if it's a taxi fare, whatever it is, as soon as somebody exchanges some sort of monetary thing for your time, that's when you can call yourself a quote unquote professional. And obviously if you're a professional, it usually delineates that you are a expert in your field. But I've always find Brendan Schaub to be one of the interesting exemptions in that regard, right? He was a former professional UFC fighter. He was a top 15 ranked. Now, it doesn't matter if you think he was good or not. It doesn't matter if you think Brendan Schaub came up in an era in the UFC where the heavyweights weren't that great in general, where the stand of fighting wasn't that great. It doesn't matter what you think. On paper, Brendan smashed it. He was a fucking former failed NFL player who didn't really go too far. He then translated that skill set to the UFC, fought at the biggest level, knocked out Mirko Krokop. You know, even though his career ended in fucking tears, he still was able to do that. So amazing he did that. But the one thing that's always really surprised me is his lack of knowledge when it comes to the UFC. He has no ability to break down fights or cards or fighters and make some astute predictions. All these predictions and fight picks are always just completely off to the point where now people on the Fire and the Kids subreddit constantly, whenever he does a fight um, pick for an upcoming UFC card, there are people on that Reddit who will purposely go and bet the opposite. So if he says one person's going to win, they'll bet the other way. And usually they'll win. And somebody put together a spreadsheet, actually, that detailed all these picks. And the majority, I think it was like over 80% of his picks he's got over the years have been wrong. And it's like, don't get me wrong. The UFC is not an exact science. Just because this guy won this fight and that guy lost that fight, it doesn't mean when they get into the ring, the one that won before is going to win. But if you watch enough the UFC, it's kind of easy to make astute predictions about how a fight will go oh this person's gonna win this might go to decision this person might get knocked out in this way because you just watch certain fights so you can see how certain people you know styles make fights this person might have a style that might you know um cause the other person problems and vice versa it's not that hard to kind of ascertain so this clip is really funny because prior to um the ufc 298 with headlining card of um the co-main event the main event being Il Ilya Toporia versus um Volkanovsky most people myself included thought Toporia would win not because Volkanovsky is terrible but because Toporia is obviously a young hungry lying on a come up and Volkanovsky's had some dog fights even though he's won a couple of them i think he's on like a free loose free loss a free loss streak or something at the moment now he's had five fights where he's been taken to the darkest waters right he's been knocked out in a couple of them in brutal fashion he's getting older like it, it, it made sense why most most people would predict that topuria would win but maybe not by a devastating knockout like he did in the second round maybe i thought it would go to decision but i never thought it was an un it wasn't like a crazy suggestion to suggest that Toporia would have won. But look at how flipping Brendan Shaw kind of depicts it. It's a really interesting way how he sort of like speaks about the fight before it happened. And again, this is a former UFC fighter, a former professional. Listen to his observation and his pick before the fight happened. But those of you picking Toporia to beat Alexander Volkanovsky, you're just, you're, it's recent bias confirmation. You're, <laughs> <laughs> I love that also. Recent bias confirmation. He's getting two different terms mixed up into one. Recency bias and bias confirmation. <laughs> Recent bias confirmation. Let's do that one more time. I love that. Recent bias confirmation. Volkanovsky, <laughs> you're just... You're, it's recent bias confirmation. You're Recency bias, confirmation bias. <laughs> Recency bias, confirmation bias. He's m melding those two things together, which are two completely different things, by the way, right? You know that, right? Recency bias 
is obviously you having bias based on what you remember recently and confirmation bias is you trying to confirm what you're already, like looking for information that already confirms what you think they're two completely different um terms but he's putting them both together and they don't make any sense but let's continue you're you forget how freaking special Volkanovsky is at featherweight. It's not even close. Yaira so again, this is not him having a favorite, which you are allowed to have. This is him saying it's not even going to be close. He's talking about Ilya Taporia as if he's some bum, as if he's some, you know, flash in a pan hype kid that people are making a big noise about because he's flashy, because he's new, but he's not that good. And you guys are underestimating how good Volkanovsky is. No. People are saying Volkanovski is amazing, but this kid is special and Volk has been in some absolute dogfights, absolute dogfights, going from the um, the win he had against Max Holloway. Like that that was, I think, uh, that went the entire five rounds. The flipping, the, the loss he has against um, Makachev, that went the distance. The win he had against... Um, he, 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 um, Yair Rodriguez, that also went, I think, to the third round. The loss against Makachev, um, and that, if I'm not, uh, the loss against Makachev again was, um, if I'm not mistaken, that was a last minute one, right? If I'm not mistaken, he, he didn't have much of a camp. I think he replaced somebody else. I forgot which one it was. And then, of course, Ilya Tapuri won. So if you made a guess that Ilya Tapuri would have beat him, it's not like a bad assumption. And of, of course, whatever we say that, it's not to denigrate Volk. And then, of course, what happens in the fight? What happens in the fight? Of course, you know what happens. Ilya Tapuri wins. Ilya Poirier wins in devastating fashion in the second round, you know, with a four-punch combo, basically, right? It was absolutely, like, scary to see um, the, the the whole sequence play out because, you know, Volk was on the floor crumpled and he didn't stand up for a while. But Ilya Poirier ends up kind of, you know, winning the belt and knocking up this legend, this fucking beast of a fighter in Volkanovski with this amazing four-punch combo, which wouldn't be a surprise if you watch a lot of Ilya Tapuria. It's not a surprise that he was able to do such a thing to Volk. It's not because Volk is terrible. It's just because of the way the UFC is. One person's advancing in age. One person's coming up in hungry. Like, styles make fights. Volk has had a really crazy run of fights where he's won some, lost some, but they've gone the distance. They've been brutal. They've been spectacular. So his body is probably taking a lot of wear and tear. I think Volk, if I'm not mistaken, is like 50. No, he's like 35. Sorry, I think Taporia is like maybe 26, 27. Like, come on, man. So that's why I'm surprised and I'm shocked when I see Brendan because I can't picture, I can't think of anybody else. Big up, um, NJ Ranger, appreciate you. He truly is the stuttering John of our <laughs> exactly, generation. Exactly, exactly. He's a dabbler in comedy. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I can't think of anybody else. Big up Andrew Angel, appreciate you. I can't exactly I can't think of anybody else who has who was a professional in their field, but is clueless. Cause I know in football, do you guys know in football, like there's plenty of footballers who don't watch football, right? I think the most famous one is Ben White the defender for Arsenal who doesn't really like football. He doesn't watch it or kind of talk about it in any way, shape or form outside of him playing for Arsenal. He doesn't, he completely kind of wants to disassociate and disconnect from it when he's outside of, of regular life. Fair enough. But I don't think if you asked Ben White about his opinion on football, he'd give you some dumb opinion. He's still going to give you an astute insight into football because he's a professional footballer. He might not like want to talk about it, but he still knows more because he plays the sport professionally and he has different insight than the regular kind of armchair fan like I am. But Brendan is unique in that he doesn't have the necessary knowledge that he should have based on his former profession. And even though he does it as a job, he still doesn't even look like he takes any care or attention or time into researching and just finding things out. Like you could have made that prediction that Taporia would have beat Volk just by looking at their fight record just on going on Wikipedia and comparing their fight record and just copy pasting the fights onto YouTube, watching some of the highlights and thinking, hmm, one person's had a lot of fights that they dominated and were on the front foot and they kind of starched most people and they were well-rounded, a couple of submissions and knockouts. The other person's had absolute wars with some of the best fighters in the division. Who's going to win? And advancing in age. It's not that difficult. So that's why when I think about Brendan, it always kind of reminds me that sometimes just because somebody does something as a job professionally doesn't mean they're an expert. You have to take everybody by a case by case basis. You can't just assume because somebody does something as an occupation that they know what they're talking about. Some people just lucked out. 
some people just get lucky um you know in life quote unquote and they make it in something that probably aren't that enthusiastic about like i still maintain to this day that i feel like brendan probably never wanted to be a ufc fighter not probably i don't think he ever ever thought about fighting his entire life but you know needs must you're hungry you want to you want to make it in la you're struggling and shit the, the football didn't work out you do what you need to do to pay the bills so he went into something he advanced very quickly because i think again in that, at that era of usc when he was in it uh, a lot of big strong guys were able to kind of make it quite far because there wasn't a lot of competition nowadays you can't just make it based on your size and your strength you have to be actually skilled but he did make it back then and he obviously was able to kind of parlay that into podcasting into stand-up so it kind of worked out for him but because of that maybe because of that genesis of him never wanting to really ever fight in his life maybe that's why he you know maybe that's why he didn't really like you know meh he never really cared anymore. Maybe that's why. Maybe, 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 maybe that's why. Um, but yeah, I found that prediction to be absolutely incredible when I saw it. And I thought, wow, okay, cool. Like, why would you just say like, he completely dismissed Aporia as if like he's some bum. It's like, I know Volker's amazing. I know Volker's beaten, beaten some absolute warriors over his time, right? Volker's beaten some absolute warriors, right? Ortega, Max Holloway, um, Korean Zombie, if I'm not mistaken. I think Korean Zombie, if I'm not mistaken. Um you know, like, like, I think he might have beat Max Holloway twice, maybe more than twice, if I'm not mistaken, right, or something like that, like, he's, fa like, Jose Aldo, um, Volker's beating over, over the time, Chad Mendes, like, he's beating some absolute beasts over the time, but let's also remember, Max Holloway's been, sorry, um, Volkanovski's been around for a while, bro, and towards the end of his, you know, run, he's had to have absolute brutal fights, brutal fights where he's kind of taken a lot of damage, right, the Makachev, but both Makachev fights were not easy, Obviously, he lost um, one of them by a crazy knockout. The other one was probably a lot more closer. The Yair Rodriguez fight in between also wasn't easy, even though he won that fight. Like, bro, like, come on, man. Like, we know what happens in the UFC when people advance in years. It doesn't really help and help situations, especially when you have to fight a young, hungry lion. Like, things can get very tricky for you very, very, very quickly. What are you guys saying here in the chat to me? Uh, big up, um, Assad. Brendan is delusional because you he really believe he could beat high-level heavyweight fighters with a double leg, even though he is not decorated wrestler or good striker. Just can't accept it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. To be fair, I think the insight that I remember that I thought, okay, this guy never stood a chance when it came to the UFC. Do you guys remember that episode where he did that fight thing with um, Eric Griffin? They did some serious thing where they would sit down and watch old fights. And Eric Griffin was asking him some questions like as a, as a casual. He was like, oh, like, you didn't watch any tape? And bro was like, no, no, no. I left it to my coaches. Like, he refused to watch tape. He didn't watch any of his fights um, back. He never watched his, his opponents fighting. He just let his coaches handle it. Now, I know some fighters do that because they just want to get to the fight and kind of turn on the fucking, you know, the afterburners. But that lack of you know review that lack of analysis was very telling because it was like oh this is why you were never able to kind of iron out some of your you know deficiencies and some of your shortcomings and some of your skill sets improved and this this explains quite a bit that you just kind of you know whatever the coach says you kind of went with and even then you know i don't really know what the game plan was when he was in the octagon in the first place but that basically said a lot about his contempt his his um you know his mindset going into fight so i didn't really i didn't really i never really understood that thing especially when you think about him not being a you know um a lifelong martial artist i think if you're a lifelong martial artist maybe it's advantageous not to be watching too many fights and be analyzing your own fights because you might get in your head a bit blah, blah blah but i think if you come into it late in life you probably need every advantage given to you so if it means watching fights, if it means going and traveling to other camps, if it means doing all this sort of stuff, you need as much as possible, as much as possible um, to kind of help yourself because you don't have the advantage of starting doing martial arts when you were like nine. You started it when you were like 26, you know what I mean? So you need to do as much research as possible to kind of get yourself up there. I would imagine, I would imagine. So, um, you know, what can you do? Um, what can you do? What can you do? 